Good morning, everyone. This is the January 12th meeting of the Elementary School Building Committee, and I'm going to make sure that we can all hear and be heard by calling out names as I see people on the screen. Uh, and uh, I'll start with you, Jonathan. Sorry, I muted myself. Good morning. I can hear you. Okay, okay. Tammy. Good morning. Jennifer. Morning. Doug. Good morning. Paul. Good morning. Rupert. Up and Adam. Adam Ant. Well, that's good enthusiasm, Angelica. <laughs> Can't top that. Good morning. <laughs> Alicia. Here. Okay. Terrific. As I see other people join, I'll just make, I'll double check that they can um, hear and be heard. So people, other people might have heard, but Phoebe wrote about a week ago or last week that um, she's not going to be, her schedule has changed in a way that she's not going to be able to be on the committee anymore. So I'm not expecting her today, um, but that is the only person who I wasn't expecting and we don't yet have the um, replacement for the school committee because it has to go through an appointment, but we will have one at the next meeting. So I think with that, Margaret, I'm gonna turn it over just for you to review yep. people for the agenda for today. today. Um, and what everyone's gonna see, it's uh, we're moving along pretty rapidly. And one of the issues that Margaret will be going over is a series of meetings that are now being set up as um, as we move forward. So, and, and including the meetings that our team has been doing. So, Margaret, you're 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 on. Okay, so we're going to start with the schedule review. There is a lot going on, but hopefully, the schedule review frames that for all of you. A lot of the update we're going to do today is on permitting. Um, uh, we've had a bunch of meetings that we have a bunch more coming. Great news on the cost estimates. So we'll give a little bit of a summary of that. Um, we are planning now that we have the estimates and are, are finalizing the documents for the 60% submit 60% construction document submission to the MSBA, which we're planning to send, assuming that you uh, give us your authorization, we're planning to send on Tuesday next week, right after the MLK holiday on Monday. Um, we're gonna give you an update on the early site package, which is advertised now on the streets, so to speak. We have moved, made some moves ahead with establishing the playground equipment working group. Um, we've got a couple of invoices and then we'll have public comments. So. Any question about that before I take that down? Kathy, I see Simone has joined. Okay, Simone, um, just I wanna make sure that you can hear and be heard. I can hear. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thanks. All right, so checking Angelica in particular, no hand for Angelica. Because <laughs> yours is always the one I miss. All right, so I'm, now I'm gonna pull up the schedule and take a few minutes to walk th everybody through what's going on here. So can everybody see that document? Looks like it. Okay, so here we are. Actually, happy new year, everyone. It's our first meeting of the new year. And now we have our meeting schedule for the whole year, which is fabulous. Um, so this is, you know what, I'm sort of calling a three month look ahead. Um, and I, I will, I've also got a week in here that is behind us because I want to just comment that the team achieved something really important over the holiday with a lot of help from Bob Perrin and from Rupert, which is we were able to, uh, Berkshire Gas was able to come in and remove the existing gas line to the building and put in a temporary service. So that is that was a task that had to happen before the early site package. So thank you, uh, big thanks to the folks from the city um, who helped with that. So, um, but looking ahead, so we have a meeting uh, today, we will have a meeting in February 
we will have a meeting in March. So I've sent holds for all of those. So hopefully that's all gonna be good. What the consultant team is doing right now. So as I mentioned, we're about to submit the 60% construction document set on Tuesday. Um, the design team is beginning the final bid document coordination. And I want to pause just to talk a little bit about the pre-qualification process. So we need, as part of this project, to pre-qualify um, the potential, the interested filed subbidders and general contractors for the project. That is a process that is, it's very important, it's fairly bureaucratic. And I have recommended to Paul that the participants in that committee be, um, first of all, Simone. Simone, you, you are would, will be involved because you are uh, the procurement officer for the for the town. Bob Parent, because of his expertise uh, in public work, and Jonathan Salvin, thank you, has volunteered um, to be a participant. Most of the work of the sort of behind the scenes work of this process will be done by ANSWER and DENISCO, uh, but that group will be meeting periodically as we move through the process to um, pre-qualify folks. And, you know, essentially this is to ensure that no one is bidding on the project that doesn't have the qualifications to do a project of this size. So that's, that's what the design team is up to. Um, Early site package, um, as I mentioned, the gas line is gone. Um, we've got the early site package documents were advertised. Uh, I think they went up as of Wednesday. Um, we are expecting the bids back, I think on January 31st. Right around that time, um, I'm working with the district um, to uh, message, uh, provide messaging to the staff and parents about the change in the traffic pattern that will occur once the fence goes up to separate the southern part of the site. Um, we believe that the uh, it'll take about a week and a half to get the contract awarded, and we anticipate that the contractor will be on the site uh, in early March. And around that time, we're planning to have a, a public event to sort of celebrate the, the physical beginning of the project. Permitting, I'm, I'm just gonna skip over this to say, we'll, we'll, we'll go into this in more detail. We have met with CONCOM. We have met with the planning board. We are getting ready to meet with the zoning board. And then we have sort of, you know, going back to those groups. And as part of that, there is also a tree hearing um, because there's a tree that has to be removed at the entry to the site. So we'll come back to that. Design coordination, um, the design team is working with all these different groups on design core ongoing design coordination. We have established a playground um, working group, which is several folks from the district and a couple of folks from the town, um, Nate Malloy and um, Paul Dethier, if I'm saying his name correctly, Paul, who um, Paul is a civil engineer and Nate is a senior planner. So that group will begin to meet on the playground equipment. Um, I, we've got a kickoff meeting, in-person kickoff meeting scheduled now for January 26th. And then we'd like to have a design subcommittee meeting and a second meeting of the playground working group on February 9th and then a third meeting um, of the playground working group on March 1st. So the times for the this meeting and this meeting are still sort of in the works. We pegged a proposed um, sustainability subcommittee meeting for mid-March. And then I also just want to comment that we have, um, we, ha we do have a few proprietary items on this project, proprietary items being things that can have to be bid because of their functionality with other with the similar materials the district is using, um, they would have to be bid uh, to. They only would be could be bid to a single source, and that requires a vote of the school committee. So we've 
put a pin in going to the school committee for that vote on March 19th. And I wanna just comment, cause we're gonna talk about this with the Corkeen. So the Corkeen material, if the, if the town and the building committee wanna pursue that, that would be included in that vote. Um, MSBA is sort of percolating along in the background. And then the last thing I wanna note on the schedule is that the school vacation week, there is going to be some additional hazardous material sampling at Fort River. Um, some was done previously, but this is really to make sure that we have the quantities right and the bid documents. So um, any questions about that super fast overview? Okay, I'm not seeing any questions. All right, so the uh, next Margaret, item. Margaret, Margaret, wait a minute. We, we, uh, oh, Angel no, Angelica, Angelica and then Kathy. Okay, Angelica. No, I was just wondering about the equipment for the playground equipment working group and my apologies if I missed any emails about that, but um, I had been hoping to join up with that committee um, mm -hmm. to offer the perspective of, of families uh, and caregivers to students with special needs about the equipment. So I'd be eager to, to find out more if I could still fit it in my schedule. Okay, why don't I send you an email with the, the dates and times and let's see if we can wrap you into that. Kathy, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say one of the other meetings you've gone into is design review. Um, you you, you, you yeah. did that. So uh, my question was on timing. So when you have the final rounds of the permitting, those have, have to be completed before, this is, I should frame it as a question. Do all those get completed before we go out for the main bidding for the, the whole project? Yes. Okay. And in fact, the, the Conservation Commission was very helpful this week because um, we actually needed what's called an order of conditions, which is their requirements mm -hmm. for the construction project. They They provided the concurrent, the notice, they agreed to provide the notice of the conditions for the early site package. Um, we do need to go back to them on the playground surfacing question, but in uh, the super short answer as Kathy is that yes, all of these would need to be complete to go to bid. Rick, were you gonna say something? No. no. Okay. Okay, that was just on timing. And then, so this early site package, that doesn't have to happen for it. So we're moving forward on that with yeah, yes. that's the notice of conditions was what we needed. And we we have that from the Conservation Commission. Thank you. Okay. So um let me um so the next thing on the item was to get into a little more detail on the permitting. Um so I'm gonna ask um Rick and Tim if they want to sort of expand it all on mm -hmm. the conversations with CONCOM. Um, and then I can I can take up the question of Corkeen. Uh, sure, the, uh, the Conservation Commission was very helpful to helping us uh, get out to bid uh, with the early site package. Um, the the siltation controls and and the and the construction controls that the conservation commission imposes on construction con, uh, projects have a cost, and Aaron was very helpful in giving us uh, ninety nine percent of the special conditions as a draft, and and with the commission closing the hearing and issuing the final means that we can get uh, the final out into the. Uh, uh, bidder's hands and i don't know if you've seen an order of conditions or or studied at it but there are a lot of conditions imposed on various uh part uh partners in the project uh it it directs things that the owner will do in perpetuity it says things that should happen during design it says things that the contractor must do and one of the things that we do to make it clear to bidders that they hit everything is to annotate the order of conditions, giving the responsibility to the various uh, players so that they know that they are the ones that are responsible for not doing this or doing this. The last 
uh, discussion with the Conservation Commission uh, was that they wrote the order of conditions uh, without any playground surfacing mentioned, which has given everybody time to study and to come up with a uh, final decision as to what would we would go back to the Conservation Commission and, and say, uh, this is what uh, the surfacing in the area, uh, the playground area will be. And the Conservation Commission's uh, jurisdictional uh, authority over the playground is the comment that there is a potentiality for uh, surface drainage that permeates through the material to uh, leach something into the into the uh, groundwater, and so that's how they get to have a say in what they think that material should be. Did I sum it up, uh, Margaret? That's great. Very helpful. Thank you. Okay. Um, any other comments you want to add about the planning board or the zoning board? So the the plant the tree hearing is rolled into the planning board hearing, right, Tim? It's yeah. not a that's right. Yeah, the tree um, hearing and the planning board hearing are both on the 17th. Um and so tree with Alan Snow is advisory to the planning board, but it's the same night, just like uh, we met with the design review board in December, which is advisory. And so then the planning review board will review the overall appropriateness and compliance of the project. Um, that will probably be one of two hearings. Um, and then on the 25th, we also also have a zoning board of appeals. Um, there are two things that we have to go before them for. One is to actually build a part of the building is in the flood prone conservancy, which is allowed by special permit. And then we are also bringing in fill to bring the building up um, and to do that, uh, also requires uh, a variance from the zoning board. So that hearing will be opened on the 25th um, and all things going well with one or two hearings, we expect all of this to be wrapped up um, in February. Um, that being said, the approval that we got from the design review board was contingent upon us coming back when we have the signage design. So all of these things are going to be approved just like the CONCOM, but we'll, we'll, when we have the final bit of information, we'll have to come back and fill out these, uh, fill in the information that was missing. Yeah, you know, I think um, planning boards in general um, that have, there's there's always some challenges between um, the, the progress of the project and sort of important uh, details like the signage, um, it's that's a pretty common uh, item to be returning to the planning board for when the signage is is designed and and uh, ready to be bid. So, any questions before we move on to money? Now, Margaret, do you want to on the agenda? We were going to talk about the playground surface at this oh, point. So yes, exactly. I think I would stay stay within that context since. That's the one condition that was yeah. not signed off on by Con Conservation Commission. Yes, thank you, Kathy. So um, I hope you all had a chance to read the memorandum that I wrote to the Conservation Commission. So, you know, in our last meeting, um, the Corkeen was raised as, as an option um, during public comment, it wasn't something that either, uh, well, Danisco or Brown Sardina or I were familiar with. So um, while the design team was uh, wrapping up the 60% cons the construction documents, I went ahead and did some research on this. So um, I'll just summarize very quickly what's in the memo. So Corkeen is a pretty new product. Um, it is a offshoot. I think my favorite part about it is it's an offshoot of the port wine industry in in um, Portugal. So the company Amarim that owns Corkeen is a is a Portuguese company, and they're basically taking the leftovers of the cork material that is put in wine bottles, and they're sort of finding an, an 
and a secondary use for it. So um, it's been, um, it was first installed in, play, began to be installed in playgrounds in Europe in 2016. So that's, a, that's quite a new product. It was introduced to the American marketplace in 2022. And the first installations of it were made in 2023. So um, there's some really good news about it. I mean, first of all, it's very it's a very porous material, which matters to the Conservation Commission because they don't want to see runoff. It, it's probably it may actually perform, I think, better than the port in place rubber. Um, the um, the the biggest sort of immediate flag on it is that, as I said, it's a new product. So, um, but it is, I mean, it is quite beautiful. And um, I, if you, I'll just pull up quickly the pictures. The, the biggest installation um, to date in the US, and I'll talk a little bit about the other New England <laughs> installations is this playground in Philadelphia. So this is the Franklin Delano Roosevelt playground um, park in Philadelphia. And last year, I believe in the fall, they installed about 24,000 square feet of the material. So it's going through its first winter. Um, but you can see from these photographs, you know, it it is it is a beautiful, um, natural looking. It's so obviously not all, <laughs> there's, there's other components in it, for instance, the binder that are not natural, but the, the substrate, I guess you would call it, is these you know small pieces of, of cork. So um, so that all of that is good news. So the the questions become, I think, for the for the committee to consider. Um, there are, I would say, some risks associated with this. Um, and I think we established in the last meeting that there is no perfect product here. So I would put this in the same category as no perfect product, um, beautiful, <laughs> um, nat you know, naturally sourced substrate. But the, the issues that I think the building committee has to consider um, as well as the town is, first of all, I think cost has to be discussed. So the material is new to the market and although this is likely to change over time, um, the current way it's being sold in the US is it's, it's being licensed to ins installers who have regional markets. So it doesn't, there's no competitors. So for instance, if you bid a uh, port in place rubber installation, there would be different people bidding on it. This is only ever in the current market ever gonna have one bidder, which is why school committee would have to take a vote on it. But it also means that you're, you're subject to that installer um, wanting, um, not having competitors. Now, the good news about the licensing is the, the reason, part of the reason they do it is market control, but part of the reason they do it is that it, um, it gives them more control over installation. So they're licensing the installation to experienced installers. In this case, um, unless something changes before we bid it in the summer, the installer is a company called No, the one that is licensed for, for New England and the, actually the whole East Coast is a company called No Fault Service, No Fault Surfaces. They also do other surfaces, for instance, port in place. And they are based in Baton Rouge, Rouge Louisiana. Um, however, their work, they're going to be doing an installation in Easton this coming spring. And I, I believe, I'm, I'm pretty certain they did the project in Philadelphia, although I haven't confirmed that. So, so overall, you're, you're going to have less control here. And although beca because it really hasn't been bid extensively, um, I the only um, numbers I've gotten so far, I talked to the gentleman in Easton who bid the gen the gentleman the landscape contractor who is doing the project in Easton. And I asked him what he thought it was likely to cost in a bid situation. And he said that he would use as a rule of thumb somewhere between 26 and $32 a square foot. Now in the estimates that we have, 
we've been carrying 25 for poured in place rubber. So if you do the math on the size of this playground, depending on, on where you are in that range, um, that's a, somewhere between a 15,000 and a hundred thousand dollar increase in cost. Um, but there's not a lot of predictability about that for the reasons that I've stated. So the second, the second risk factor is warranty. So what they are, what Corkeen is doing by licensing the installation is they are giving you a five-year warranty. We're going to ensure that you have a quality installer. It may cost you more, but you know we're, we're backing these people. We're going to give you a five-year warranty. Um, I thought Brown Sardina commented, I mean, it's important to understand that the construction industry and the designers in particular do not embrace risk with new products. Um, Brown Sardina, uh, Bill Brown wrote that um, they do not typically specify new materials until they have been st installed for at least five years and there's a minimum of 10 installations. So that is not the situation. The only place in New England that this has been installed as uh, last year, about 200 square feet of it was installed on a playground in Carlisle. So this has nowhere near the kind of track record. Um, it may be fabulous, but it's the track record that most designers would look to, to make sure that they had, um, they were providing something that they could stand behind. The third risk factor is resilience. So although we don't have all the data, we do know um, uh, that the this material, while resilient, is not as resilient as port-in-place rubber. And it's a matter of degree. I mean, obviously, um, it's got a lot of other advantages. But one of the things that it may impact, for instance, is the design of the playground equipment, because the design team may recommend using playground equipment, which has a, a lower height um, in order to mitigate the fact that the material, if corkeen is used, the material isn't gonna be as resilient. So that is my brief dissertation on corkeen. So questions. I see Rupert has his hand up and Kathy. So Rupert? Uh, can you just clarify, please, what you mean by resilient? Is it like how soft it is or how yeah. durable it is or, or what? Yeah, it's how flexible it is. Yeah. That's, okay. Rupert, that's the fall protection angle. So that's that's yeah. the cushioning. Got it. That's what I thought, but I just wanted it to be clear. Thanks. Yep. No, good question. So I see Kathy, Angelica, Alicia, and Doug. So Kathy, you want to go next? Uh, yeah, just on a, from what Margaret, I think she put it in her memo, it's the school in Easton, Rupert, is saying that a fall from eight feet or more wouldn't be protected. So don't have equipment that someone could fall off of that's eight feet, 10 feet tall. You know, so it's thinking that way. So I have a, a question on... Um, the, if we take a revote to allow the design team flexibility to choose within the budget, um, if if there were equipment as a swing set, is a swing set eight feet taller than swing, and does someone climb to the top of the swing set? Like, would there be any um, way of saying part of this might be one surface and part of it might be might be another, or is it a if we switch, it's all or nothing. So that's a basic question. And then um, I'd like to stay within the budget uh, for this. And I know we have that in our cost estimates. So it feels to me that the design team with our landscape and the playground equipment could be thinking of, we've got 14,000 square feet now. Is, is there some flexibility to stay within the budget if it was slightly less square feet, you know, as you're starting to look at the playground equipment, Doug and Tammy, you know, on what's going to go on this surface. This is all about 
what's underneath the playground equipment. We're going to have grass. We're going to have basketball courts. We're going to have other play surfaces. Um, so those are my two questions. Um, and I thought, and I think it's that height, Margaret. It's not that it's not, you know, if you if you fall off it from five feet, you're going to be fine. This is yeah. It's, that's a, that's exactly right. Yeah. And then the yeah, one other, I, the, I, one, I, the one, the one. Yeah, go on. You mentioned Rick. the height and the swing set, and the swing set is the example, but but climbing on top of the swing set frame isn't really the eight foot height. It's actually pretty common at the top end of a swing arc. So the, it's, the it's swing not arc. it's not as as unusual as you th think it might be. So the one other property Margaret didn't mention that's nice about Porkeen is heat. Angelica, you had raised, uh -huh. and this doesn't heat up. Um, you know it. So not there's one picture in the ads with when Margaret said pours. They have a little girl trotting out with a pail of water, and she pours it in, and there's no puddle. I mean, it just goes right through. So this has a property for on rainy days. You're still going to yeah. go back outside without a without a puddle. So it, it's got a, some very nice properties, and in Europe. Uh, the some of the early adopters of this are Norway and Sweden, so it has been in cold climates. But mo what Margaret is telling us is, even there, it's not like twenty years of history. It's 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 yeah. a short. History. And Kathy, thank you for bringing that up because I I, I mentioned last night and failed to mention this morning. So uh, the the sales guy for Corkeen told me that there is a couple of school districts in Texas, for instance that are using this material quite a bit recently and and it's the heat issue so it um the what the portland place rubber people are doing by comparison is they're starting to use very light colors as the the color mix i visited a playground in easton um, that was adjacent to the site of this upcoming playground project that was had acres of portland place rubber but it's all super light colors right so um, you know, the, the industry recognizes that issue in the Port and Place River, but Corkeen is an alternative that seems to have very good performance around heat. So, okay, so Angelica, I think you are next. Thanks, Margaret. And thanks, Kathy, for noting that. That's fantastic to hear about that, that because heat is such an issue. And my question was more about accessibility. And if you could talk a little bit more about that. So how does resilience relate to that? Because that's that was a big concern in our factor before was choosing for it in place. Um, there was that it, it was much more accessible for um, learners with wheelchair mobility issues and not having to have the ground be unstable all the ground yeah. all the time and having support. So if you could speak a little more on that. Well, I mean, I I don't have any numbers to point to, but it's its appeal is that it has a comparable performance to the port in place rub, rubber for accessibility. It's, it's a very accessible surface compared to the engineered wood fiber, which, you know, as we discussed, we've discussed a couple of times has some limitations. Okay, I think Alicia, you might have been next. Um, yes, thank you, Margaret. So I think that um, considering the feedback that we've got from CONCOM, and I think the Board of Health also wanted an opportunity to take a look at this, um, my question is more about process in terms of like wh in which direction we will then take this starting today. So I think Kathy mentioned that we do have the possibility of taking a vote um, to sort of allow flexibility for um, those who are designing the playground equipment, which I think would be a good course of action. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm then just wondering, would, would we then anticipate that we would allow for the Board of Health to make a recommendation and that they would then take that recommendation into consideration? And um, is CONCOM, it says that they us to bring it back to them um, and so I'm wondering what that means and does that mean that they are looking for us to change our decision and bring that back to them to get uh, an approval for that portion of the project so again like my question is more about process and where we go from here in order to I think in my opinion um, we should at least allow the flexibility for the people working on the playground equipment to look into the other options um, but just not actually looks like in terms of process. So Alicia, can we put a pin in that? Because that, that is where we're headed with this discussion. I wanna just hear from Doug and Jonathan 
if they yeah. have comments that are not process related and come back to that. So Doug, yeah. did you have a comment you wanted to add to this? Uh, <clears throat> the thing I just wanted to ask was, you know, uh, Kathy mentioned in this, along these lines, uh, same sort of thing. She mentioned that some of the installations in Europe are in Northern uh, uh, countries. And so I was wondering if we know much about those installations or Durba, how long they've been there. So, you know, if they have five or six years of experience in those Northern uh, installations, that'd be really useful information if we've got it. If we don't, we, if we could find out, that would be helpful. Um, just because I think that's more parallel, you know, a bunch of installations in Portugal and Spain don't help us as much because they have more temperate climate. But anyway, thanks. Yeah. So let me um, let me <laughs> respond to that and take Jonathan's uh, question next. So um, I definitely encourage you all to go look at the Corkeen website. It's it's very good actually. So um, what I'm showing you here is this is this is their um, I think this page is, is their case study page, right? So you can. <laughs> You can see here's I'm pretty sure this is the project in Philadelphia, right? Here's all the projects in Europe. You can sort of zoom in and sort of see the locations and you can click on them and see the projects. So some of them are larger, some of them are smaller, um, but then they have case studies. Um, I haven't looked at all of these, but let's just take a look at this one in Norway. Um, so they have they have pictures of them. I don't have records of the the history. Like they they're not giving dates in this website of the history, but I'm sure they have that information available. Um, Margaret, the previous slide on on a Norway installation I think was 2020 in yep. fine print. Yeah, like where but uh, it did. Yeah, yeah, that make that makes sense. So again. Um, 2021. Yeah, it's it's pretty new, <laughs> pretty new product. So, um, okay, Jonathan, you had a question. I had a couple of questions. Most of them were uh, like Alicia's about process and where we're mm -hmm. going forward from today and what the you know what that process would be. I do have a, but I do have a, a concrete question, which is the installation in Easton. How big is that? How's it compared to what we're doing? I would say the playground in Easton is probably a third of the area. Um, I'll, I'll, I have photographs of it um, that I'll, I'll poke around and look for, but I would say it's probably about a third of this playground area. And how, um, how big is that one in Philadelphia? Is that that one is 20, 24,000 square feet? Yeah. Is so it possible ours is, to reach so out to them and get the comparative costs? I mean, it's a slightly different construction market. I'm, I'm just hoping to, yeah. to narrow, if we can, narrow down that um, cost per square foot range. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I am planning to, to track down and talk to these folks. <laughs> oh, here. I have found the picture. So um, this is a photograph from my visit to Easton. So this is the playground where they installed the playground equipment um, in the fall. That's that's some that's another site. Um, so it's it's between a middle school and an elementary school, and it's kind of a longish, narrowish playground with a set of yeah. That may be the best picture. So I I mean I'm guessing it's about maybe a third to a half of the size of this one. So okay. Um so we'll come back to process. Paul. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um so um I'm kind of challenged by this uh, in the sense that um you know our consultant is not recommending it. Um I need. I'm, I'm sort of having the same questions that Alicia raised. Like, what is our our process, and when are we making the decisions, and when do we have to make decisions? Um, you know, I I never am one who wants to be the first out of the gate on some of these things because you just don't know the experience, and that's why our consultants not recommending it. Um, I, but that being said, you know, it's Amherst. We like to do things first, so sometimes this will be. It's going to be a really remarkable, great 
win for us. So I'm open to that idea. You'll have um, a, you'll have a lot of visitors. Yeah, um, but in terms of you know the you know I'm always going to be focused on costs and anything that's going to cost us more money. Um, for what advantage is a real question for me um, because there's a lot of needs that are going to be expressed during this building project and a lot of things that we eliminated in the project. So I just want I don't want this to be a standalone thing. I want it to be if it's a a significant cost differential if it's in a if it's in the fifteen thousand dollar range, but it's probably not that big. But if it's in the hundred thousand dollar range, probably pretty more significant. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I think you know all we are going from is the the manufacturer right now, and like, well, of course it's going to be all you know, you know, roses and honey and all that kind of stuff. So, but it, it, I, it, I'm just really challenged to with a construction project to do something that's really not been done in America before. So. That's that's my orientation, but I'm yeah. open to hearing more about it and and understanding exactly why we are going in this direction. Okay, well, let me so let me talk about the process piece a little bit. I mean, the challenge here, and we talked about this a little bit the last meeting, is the des design team needs to keep going with their design. We don't want to create a, a wrinkle in what they're doing. Um, and so when I, so I attended the Board of Health meeting last night because they, they wanted to hear, you know, what you have heard this morning. And I would say, I expect that both the Board of Health and CONCOM are going to, well, Board of Health will provide comments um, on the project. I don't believe, Paul, maybe you could help me here. I think they are, it's an advisory board, correct? Well, there, I don't think they have a permitting authority on this. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I mean, again, like if we're looking for, con anyway, I'll stop there. Yeah. So the CONCOM, on the other hand, has permitting authority. So um, I would say that, you know, if you think back to that schedule, we need to go back to CONCOM relatively soon in order to allow the design team to proceed. So I would argue that it, is, it would be ideal, since this committee is only meeting monthly at this point, it would be ideal if there was a vote taken today that allowed the design team to, to proceed seamlessly without needing to come back to this group for a further update. Paul? Is it possible to bid it with two alternatives, with an alternative, like do one and then the alternative pricing for the second. So when the bids come in, we can compare and contrast the two prices. So I would love to do that because I think it puts them on notice that if, mm. you know, that they they are need to match a price, but that's, that is a little bit of a figment in the marketplace. Um, I don't know, Rick and Tim, I, I I guess there's a world in which we could go back to Concom after we bid it. That would be that was a, that? that's a world that would have to happen. Concom wants wants to know what is going down in the project at what is going to be built, and if we say wait until the bids are in. Uh, there's also a question of whether that whether the product would be considered a de minimis change or requiring opening the he hearing. And I don't think Aaron uh, could comment when things like that were discussed. Aaron Jakes being the administrator for Concom. So we're not, I <laughs> well, we're also we're not we're not going out to to bid right now with the intention of having any other alternates. But of course, there's this statutory requirement of having alternates uh, be accepted in, in order. So if there was a second uh, alternate in the project and the, the surface was an alternate, you basically would have to accept the surface alternate so that CONCOM knew what you were doing. If it wasn't for the Conservation Commission and the orders and their interests, it, it would be a different question. Um, 
Rick and Tim, I would like to hear your perspective about the design impact here, because I think uh, the the details of this material are different. So, um, from a from a you know continuing to stay on track with your construction documents, when do you need an answer on this in order to go forward? The the permeability of the surface. Uh, of the two surfaces, port in place rubber and corkine, have absolutely no effect on the drainage system or anything that was assumed for the uh, uh, stormwater calculations that went to the Conservation Commission. So that decision is A or B, no issues. It's designing, now we're starting to form a committee and design the playground equipment. So knowing which material will be used will start to affect height. And as Paul mentioned, he would like, and some others mentioned, that if, as we get a handle on what a cost might be if proprietary, then maybe there's less of the material. So that all comes into the design of the playground. And since we're trying to start designing the playground in earnest in February, the decision should be made by then. We can't have too many variables in the surfaces because the surface can affect the playground size and the surf for cost and the surface can affect the playground equipment because of fall heights. Tim, do you so, have any? The, so our, the next meeting of this group is February 16th. So I would, what I would say is we, we, we cannot make the decision definitively any later than that meeting. Is that, does that work Rick, for you and Tim? I think looking at the projected schedule for the playground working group, it looks like it falls in with that. Kathy. Um. To address Paul's concern, I, I agree, Paul, 100,000 is a big difference. Um, mm -hmm. So if, as I heard you, Rick, you know, one of the, I'm prepared to make a motion to give you flexibility uh, to explore this alternative surface within um, a budget um, and then come back to us. Because I think we have to do, we, it sounds like we, we likely have to make a change to get the final permit from the Conservation Commission unless we can somehow allay their concerns about the PIP, the PIP rubber problem. So my my question would be, um, I'm I have a background in negotiations, so this is I, but never never about this. That if this manufacturer and their their installer knew that they might have a big project in Massachusetts as opposed to a smaller project that they're they're breaking into a market. Could we get a better feeling for the total cost given the size? So what I think Jonathan was saying, you might do more per square foot if you're only doing a small piece, if you're getting a bigger installation the way Philadelphia did. And they are doing, they're doing 26 playgrounds in Texas. So this is not a, it's it's going to be in the marketplace, just not a lot in the Northeast. And the, the Western part of the country has got an installer that's got some in the works too. So I'm, I'm looking for, I know it's part of the general contractor piece, but if you are really talking hardball that um, the price is going to matter on this, um, uh -huh. could we be closer then to knowing it? So if it the surface needs to be somewhat smaller, Rick, for, but then think of the playground equipment, you know, I mean, it's, you know, but not a lot smaller to come within the budget. Um, so that's my sort of the interaction of the amount of it, the play, what equipment is going on top of it um, and needing to make, give you all um, the, the, the go, go for it uh, vote from the committee to allow you that flexibility to move this forward. That that's my interactive kind of comment on this. 
So um, let's the let, let comment from Paul and then a comment from Jonathan. And then, Kathy, I want to respond to part of that. No, Paul. I think that I think and, Luke and, would have the same. Yeah. yeah. So I just quick question. So what's driving this, it sounds like is the conservation commission permit. That's what's driving it. And I guess the question is, has the conservation commission said they're not going to permit port in place material in the town or are they saying in, at this location, there's so much that it's because of the water runoff because that's pretty broad implications to all of our institutions here. It does. It has broad implications. So they're saying they're, they're, they want to ban. They, they haven't, they have not said that definitively. In fact, I, I, my sense was that they, uh, they read the memo and they understood that there was more work to be done mm -hmm. on it. But at the first meeting, um, they expressed, you know, very significant concern about mm -hmm. the port in place rubber. Yeah. We're hearing that. Yeah. And, okay. and Paul, this was particularly because of where we are, to wetlands where we are to the river you know so you, in a different location it might not be that i'm just saying it might not be but that's what brought us before concom in the first place that's why that was my question yeah is it yeah. is it unique but, to the site or is it is it about the material the toxicity of the material in general i i mean my, my it, it's hard to tell but i i think it would, may have been different for different people but i will say that i think that decision for whatever reason, has implications for future projects. Great, thank you. Jonathan? Um, <clears throat> I'm certainly open to giving the design team uh, the ability to go and explore this, uh, you know, between now and our next uh, meeting uh, to, to get a little bit more resolution. And, and Kathy was correct, my, my previous question about the size was related to, you know, the notion of, of larger installations being um, you know, usually a little bit more cost effective. I think we should be honest with ourselves and honest about what the design team can do um, towards towards keeping this at equal. Um, it is a new product. It's a new product in the the area. You know, I wouldn't trust uh, numbers from Texas. Um, it's a totally yeah. different uh, you know labor market. They 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 can do things down there much cheaper than we can up here. Um, you know, I think Philadelphia is similar enough. They have a similar, you know, uh, public procurement processes that are, are more like ours than they would be in Texas. Um, and so I would, I would love to be able to put a finer point on it, but I think we have to accept, um, that there's only so much the design team is going to be able to figure out with a, with a product this new when it comes to, you know, kind of final cost ahead of an actual bid. Um, and so, you know, I, that doesn't change my supportiveness towards exploring it, finding out more. It is a new product. Um, it has some admirable features. Um, I think, you know, as long as we're not derailing ourselves uh, uh, in our overall timeline, I think it's I think it's worthy of exploration. Rupert. <clears throat> uh, I'd just like to share my perspective for a moment. Um, I, I want to echo uh, concerns about uh, relatively untested products. Uh, we don't really, uh, in my opinion, have a very strong track record of this, of success with experimental products. Uh, I'm thinking, for example, of an electric bus that hasn't run for two years now. Mm -hmm. uh, it was er early on in, in, in the electric bus market. Uh, so I'm fairly skeptical. I think the other thing to throw in for consideration is when you need to repair a uh, port in place, there are a lot of vendors that can come and do repairs. Uh, but That's very long, good point. Long term maintenance of Corkeen is going to depend on some company in Louisiana. Makes me very nervous. Mm -hmm. uh, excellent point. Okay. Um, I don't see any more hands. Kathy, do you want to make a motion? Yeah, so I'll I'll make a formal uh, a motion and people can make it sound more like a motion if it doesn't 
quite work. <laughs> I moved to allow the design team flexibility to further explore the surface for the uh, playground area um, and with consideration of total cost. And they should come back with us with a decision um, by our next meeting. I would second or, that one. Yeah. Um, is there any, Rupert? Let's see, Rupert. Uh, do you want to add into the motion just a suggestion uh, that they consider not only cost, but the implications for what kinds of equipment we can put into such a playground? Yeah. That, uh, um, yes, and I will totally add that. And Margaret, later we can uh, do the specific wording in the minutes, but, you know, mm -hmm. that the yeah. con consideration of cost and to what extent it limits the choice of equipment um, that we can put on the playground. Alicia? Um, would it be possible or make sense to also include something about the actual concerns, which is which are why we are reconsidering this. And so maybe something about um, um, the feedback from CONCOM and also the input from the Board of Health. Um, I guess my reaction, Alicia, is this motion is because of those two things. So we don't need to put it in the motion um, where we're, we're, this is an effort specifically to get the permit from the Conservation Commission, which we need to move forward. So the motion is addressing that. I don't think we have to put it put it in. Um, so would it be like included, like how would the design team, like that will be included in a memo that we want this to happen because of these concerns? Because I yeah. think it's not simply like cost implications, like if they come back and it's a certain cost, but I think also the implications of what the actual concerns are need to be considered. Mm -hmm. No, I, I, I agree. I'm just saying that I don't think we need to put all that in the motion. So I think we can- But I think that the motion itself, as it reads, as we're saying right now, is to just consider the cost implications and what type of equipment can be used on top of that material. We're not saying to take into consideration anything else. So I'm just wondering how we know that that is implied in this motion if it's not explicitly stated. Okay, so we, we could add to secure, uh, successfully secure a permit from the Conservation Commission. Does that work? I um, I'm thinking more along the lines of like, with consideration of the specific concerns from the Conservation Commission and the recommendation from the Board of Health. I don't, I'm, I'm not comfortable putting the Board of Health in. I think the Conservation Commission is the key here because they are the permitting authority. Um, so I don't know how other people feel. I just think the motion, uh, I guess, the, the reason we're making this motion is we had to, we've got an, an approval all but for the playground surface. So this is getting, giving the design team the flexibility to meet the concerns of the Conservation Commission. Maybe that's the way to, to word it um, with a recommendation for a surface. We, we, the project can't move forward without that permit. Paul, did you wanna add something? Well, I think we um, we're asking we're, this. What you're trying to make the motion on is to instruct the or allow the architects to do something. They're not environmental specialists. So I don't think I don't want to spend an enormous amount of time on this. That's money, um, and you know I don't think they're going to come back and say here are the health effects of it. That's that's you know that's our responsibility or someone else's responsibility to make that qualitative judgment. I don't think the architects. Are going to come back and say, "Here's here's all the here's a bevy of studies about you know poured in place rubber versus poured in place um, cork." I have not seen anything from the Board of Health, so I'm not sure. I wasn't at the meeting. I guess there was a discussion last night, but I don't know what people are referencing in that regard. So I don't want to reference Board of Health because we don't know what they're talking. I don't know what they've ref if they've taken an action or not. So, 
So I can say they did not take an action. They asked me the same question that you all are asking about timeline. And I told them that I thought by the time of the next committee meeting, this committee would have to make a definitive <clears throat> decision in order to keep allow the design to <clears throat> proceed in a sort of appropriate manner. And that was keeping in mind that um, you know there's there's other permitting processes going on at the same time. So. Alicia, your hand is still up. Do you want to add something? Yes. Um, yes. So I think my intention is not to make, like, it is just for them to take these things into consideration. Like, I'm not asking them to be the experts on these things, but I think it's important that they give consideration to the reason why the permit was not approved. Like, not just simply the permit was not approved. How can we move around this? But why was it not approved? And taking that into consideration is going to be critically important. Um and I don't think that that's asking them to be experts. I think that that's just asking them to be mindful of the concerns that came out of the CONCOM meeting. Um, and as it goes for the Board of Health, like that is our town's board that would be, like that is their responsibility is to look into those things. And I think at their meeting, they, re <clears throat> they expressed interest in having the ability to weigh in. So I think mm -hmm. simply asking them to consider those things is not even... Like, it's not saying that they have to go with what the Board of Health's recommendation is. It's just saying that these things should be taken into consideration. And I think considering the concerns and the interests that were expressed by both the Board of Health and CONCOM, that it would be in our best interest to bring them into the conversation at like as it is possible, not over necessarily. Um, so that this can be successful in moving forward. Kathy, oh, Rupert has his hand up. That's yeah. okay, Rupert, Rupert has his hand up. I'm Rupert? trying to I'm trying to write something right out. emotion I I think yeah, I can see ahead. you were doing that. so while you're doing that Rupert thank you I, I I guess I'd like to suggest that uh the concom can ask their own questions and advice from the uh board of health uh we don't need to direct the architects to get involved in that so so here here's um I'm trying to wordsmith this to uh, get us to be able to vote on it. Uh, a move to allow the design team flexibility to consider alternative uh, surfaces for the playground to address concerns raised by the Conservation Commission within the costs in the budget and consideration of the impact on choices of playground equipment. It's a very long motion, but it's basically... Yeah giving very, the design team flexibility to move very, this forward. Very well done. So it's addressing the concerns of the Conservation Commission, which which are the, the it's the runoff from underneath um, of, of the surface. So if, are people ready to move forward with that motion and vote on it? I'm not seeing any hands up, so I think the answer is yes. And and I realize what we're doing is we're we're in effect saying we're willing to take some risks because we want to take move this project forward. <laughs> we realize one of these is a new material, so I'll go across the screen and the order I see people. Tammy, actually, Kathy, I just want to make sure. So you're you're making a motion. Who's the second here? I think Jonathan, Jonathan, oh. do you see my, okay. my, my ever my ever longer motion? Okay. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Tammy. <clears throat> okay, she said yes, although I didn't hear her. Um Jennifer. Yes. Uh Rupert. I'm gonna say no. Okay. Uh Simone. Yes. Paul. I'm gonna vote no. Uh, Jonathan? Yes. Doug? 
Yes. Angelica? Yes. Alicia? Yes. And Kathy is a yes. So, um, Margaret, did you take, did you keep uh -huh. it? Yeah. Okay. okay. So the motion passes and we pushed it back to our very skillful team. Okay. Thank you, team. Um, not an easy subject, but um, we're we're going to get there. So, all right. So I'm going to switch to something that is a little bit easier, um, which is just an update on the 60% estimates, which um, again, hopefully you saw my memo, which documented the very good news, which is that um, this is this is the nugget here. So the the value, the construction value and the funding agreement is this first number, 81337167. The two estimates came in very close together. Um, the Fogarty estimate, which is the designer's estimate, is considered the designer, the estimate of record here. So you can see it's say, you know, safely below um, the funding agreement. And then I also um, want to just, uh, I'm going to switch to a different screen. I want to kind of give a picture of what this means in the larger uh, world of um, what is still embedded in this project that is protecting the owner as we move forward. So the early site package is about to be bid. So it has less contingency in it than the building package, which won't be bid till the summer. So this, um, this uh, little calculation here is just kind of pulling out of the estimates those numbers. So um, as you hopefully will remember, we, we carry what's called the design and pricing contingency on the design until it is bid. And we also continue to carry escalation. So, for the early site package, those numbers are small now because we're actually out to bid. And for the building and site package, they're bigger. So embedded in these estimates is a little over $3 million of escalation. Now you've seen this process at work. You've seen, as we've gone through this process, the, the, the design and construction contingency escalation have shrunk over time as the building gets designed and gets ready to bid. But that that's what's in the estimates now that is protecting you. And then also as a reminder about the overall project budget, there is um, a soft cost contingency, which is sort of for fees and services generally, but also a construction contingency of a little over $4 million. So, um, you know, really the, the one to sort of focus on now is this one, but just a reminder that there are also contingencies for the future as we move into construction. So before I take that down, does anybody have any questions? I don't see any hands, so I'm gonna stop the share. So- um, uh, Jonathan's hand is up. Oh, Jonathan. Sorry, just real quick, and remind us again that the main package is going to go the, the not the early package. But the main package is going out in which month? July. July. Okay, so there's that two percent escalation yeah. between now and July. Correct. For changes expected changes due to inflation. Yeah. Tim, yeah. Rick, do you want to add anything about the estimating process? Uh, Where we are at this point. Uh, there was a lot of discussion other than that. I think the committee can have confidence in both estimators. Uh, they weren't trying to get anywhere and we didn't figure out what the final number was, was till the very end when we talked about the design contingency and the markups. So yeah. it's a pretty good place to be. There's no closing your eyes and hoping in it. <laughs> Kathy. 
Uh, the other thing I saw when I looked at the most recent on the two different estimators is that um, we do seem to be out of the close your eyes and six months later, it's doubled in cost world. We're, 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 we're you know, it, it, I just remember from, there was one period of six months where the, the price of glass went up in a ridiculous amount per square foot uh, you know, for, for our windows. So I th think it's good news. And then the one other thing um, on the timing of this, you know, again, this is fingers crossed, but interest rates are starting to come down. So your, your, your timing, Jonathan, of when we go out with the main, when, when the big money has to flow, I, 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 I think we're going to benefit um, in, in both directions, that s some of the worst is over and not that this is a cheap project. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think a really important thing to keep in mind relative to this is just to go back to the um, my crazy schedule slide for a moment. So we're gonna, we have the bids due for the early package right at the end of January. Actually, it's a, it's the eighth. We're giving them four weeks because of the design aspect of the peers. Okay, so it's yeah. the eighth, all right. It's just a week different. Right, so um, that means that the week before the next DSBC meeting, we will we will have those numbers for you. So we will be able to report on that. I'll, I'll probably, as I have been, send out an email update. Um, but um, that's that's going to be a really major milestone. It's also going to give us some feedback about the market. So, Jonathan, okay. Jonathan's hand is up again. I Jonathan? think. Just one quick last comment. I assume just like most of the public uh, estimate bidding estimating that I've been involved with the estimators aren't aren't trying to establish the low bidder they're trying to hit the middle of the pack um correct and that's always something yeah. to bear in mind it, it's that second the the second low bid I think is what they try to focus on right yeah okay construction document submission. So um, yesterday I sent out the table of contents. Um, as you will have noted, if you looked at that document, there's really no new material here other than that the MSBA looks for other than an, a, they, at this point, they pay very close attention to where we are with permitting for the reasons we just discussed, which is we wanna be able to move seamlessly into construction. So um, I would like to ask the committee uh, for a vote to authorize the submission of the 60% package on beginning of next week. I'd like to make that motion that we accept the 60% package as submitted. Shane seconds. Thank you. So Are there any comments or discussion? Uh, so I will go again on the order I see people on my screen. Tammy? Yes. Jennifer? Yes. Rupert? Rupert, I. Simone? Yes. Paul? Yes. Jonathan? Yes. Doug? Yes. Angelica? Yes. Alicia. Yes. It's unanimous. And I want to just with that unanimous, I just want to thank the team for moving all these pieces to this point. Um, and so th thank you very much. Lots of pieces right now. So, okay. So, um, I think we can go through the next couple of items pretty quickly. So um, we have on the agenda an update on the bidding of the early site package. So Rick, Tim, do you want to add anything to the conversation we've had so far about that process? Uh, just that uh, it's a chapter 30 process, which is which means it's not 
uh, DCAM certified general construction. We do that because these are really earthwork people. And we want to make sure that people that uh, can do the work are uh, included and brought in and you don't necessarily have to be DCAM certified. But that does mean that we, like the old days before construction reform, after the bids are in, there is a review to make sure that the low bidder is in fact responsible based on the submission with their bid of representative projects so that they can prove that they're able to do it. So that's a little something different in this, in this realm. Uh, we have a non-mandatory site walkthrough next Wednesday. Uh, I think it's three o'clock in the afternoon after school's out. So, and I haven't checked recently. So I don't know. It was advertised Wednesday. I don't know if anybody's picked up the drawings yet. It's on it's on bid docs. I haven't happened to check. Yeah, Ksenia, can you tell us what you see on bid docs? I'll check what I see on bid docs, but I know that I've had people reaching out directly to me and I've had to direct them back to bid docs because not everyone reads the advertisement fully. So yes, there's interest. Great, thanks. So that's it on the... So the 17th. The afternoon of the 17th. Right. The second, the second. Okay. Okay. Anything else on early site package? Okay. I think we've already talked about this one, but the next one was next steps with the playground equipment working group. So Angelica, as I promised, I'll sort of, I'll provide those dates and times to you and hopefully you can join us. The, the first meeting is going to be an in-person meeting. The others, I think, will probably be on Zoom. So, um, the uh, again, those those dates, um, I'll put the dates in the schedule as a follow up. But um, I think we're all systems going. Paul, thank you for coordinating assistance from the town with that group. So, so with that, we are ready to turn to invoices. So, Kasanya. I'll and, just, and then take the screen um, and I will, before I get into invoices, here's bid docs. So this is <laughs> our list of current plan holders. So there's quite a few. I, I haven't gone through it yet to understand if they're all um, meaningful. Um, sometimes um, people like publications register, but actually all of these look like general contractors and site yeah. people. E ETNL is actually a, a site contractor that did a... ESP for us on another school project. I gave him a call and let him know it was out there. Excellent. And we will do more outreach as necessary if we don't see some, you know, likely candidates already on the list. All right, invoices. Thank you. So this month's package, let me just send this and can everybody see this pretty well? Zoomed in enough? Okay. So this is a summary of the, this month's package. The total value due is 373231 uh, and 14 cents. Um, it is uh, composed of an invoice from Answer Advisory, several invoices, four from Danisco of Architects, um, and two more I'll talk about in a second that are related to the gas um, line relocation that happened over the Christmas break. The answer invoice is um, 24802 and it represents a 1% progression over the 14% previously paid. So bringing it up to 15% complete, of course, a lot more work ahead. And a lot of it really is in, in the, going to be in the construction oversight in the future. Um, the Danisco services, uh, it's a progression of 5% of their contract value, bringing them to 47% complete. That is not to say that they're only 40% done with design, but they also have um, services, significant services in the construction phase. So um, there are four invoices. The first one of them is the major one for most of the design services progression. And then there's three invoices in addition to that for um, consultant services, wetlands surveying, and traffic engineering. 
Um, the two new companies popping up here, Taylor Davis Landscape and Construction and Tansy and Elm Electric, they were both involved in the school department's efforts to um, investigate. Uh, so Tansy Electric investigated some of the underground electrical lines um, before any digging was done to create a new trench for a new gas line to be laid in to the ground. Um, and they did a small bit of repair for a, a line that was unfortunately damaged despite all best efforts. Um, and then Taylor Davis uh, came in and they milled uh, the pavement uh, above the trench to create a neat transition and to allow the material to be reused later. And those invoices were 3000 and 1100 Right now, no additional costs are projected for those two vendors, um, but they may be available on standby in the future. This is the detail of those. I will gently and not too slowly flip through each page of a package. Please stop me if you see something that interests you and you have questions. Okay, that's the end. Any questions? Rupert? Uh yeah, I just, if I may, I'd just like to make a comment. There is one other contractor involved with the um, gas line trenching. The invoice didn't get to uh, uh, get submitted on time, but it's uh, another $441 that will eventually come before us. All right. You'll forward that when that's available? Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's from Elm Electric. Oh, that, that is, <laughs> is, is Dandy and Elm the same thing? Oh, no, they're two different companies. Oh, interesting. Okay. I guess uh, it's so, And I think the eight, uh, I think the 1187.50 is just the Tansy. Okay. Um, but I can double check that. Yeah, right. and I, I, I just want to add to Ksenia's presentation. So we have reviewed this package and are recommending it to the committee for their approval. Correct. Mm-hmm. Are there any other comments? Then I move to uh, accept the invoices and accept and pay the invoices. <laughs> Is there a second? Second. Okay, so once again, uh, Tammy. Yes. Jennifer. Yes. Rupert. Yes. Simone. Yes. Paul. Yes. Jonathan. Yes. Doug. Yes. Angelica. Yes. Elisha. Yes. And just so people know, these are all being cross-checked before they come to us. Um, we, we were assured that early on. So I don't see any other comments right now and i see one member of the public has raised her hand um so if it's okay with people i'll move to public comments and just so people know we do these at the end of the meeting and i and we have uh six people let me see let me see six people in the audience including um and i'll call on the first person deb leonard who has her hands raised bruce caldman uh, per, a staffer from Donesco, Rudy Perkins, Tony. Um, I've been asked to do this. Tony, Bruce Coleman, Rudy Perkins, Maria Kopecki. So Deb, I am bringing you in. If you unmute, you're part of our group. Hi, I think I successfully unmuted. Yes, you did. Okay, hi. Um, my name is Deb Leonard, and I am uh, a new member to the Amherst School Committee, and I expect that I will be um, appointed to this committee as the school committee representative. So um, I'm just getting up to speed. Thank you for all your work. Do I have a time limit, Kathy? Yeah, we, we, we limit it to three minutes, Deb, and there's... Okay. You can ask questions we don't interact so we will take okay. your comments and okay. 
and respond later as needed. So I'm looking at the school committee vote on if you go forward with Corkeen on the 21st, and I think you're going to want to separate the vote out from any kind of information presented on Corkeen or any alternatives before that, because I think the school committee is going to need some time to consider it and frame any questions that they may have. So I don't really know. I mean, it looks like the timing is really, really tight and already that March March meeting is going to be later than than you want. So um, I'm just going to encourage you to anticipate the need of the school committee to ask questions. That's Thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you for your comment, Deb. Uh, Maria Kopecki, you are with us. Okay, and unmuted, presumably. So uh, thank you, Maria Kopicki, South Amherst. Um, uh, two things. The first is uh, really brief. The softball backstop is still not back in the cost estimates for the 60% construction. So could we please get that back in there? Um, the second is about the playground surfaces. Um, Somebody on the committee asked, you know, why are we why are we doing this? Well, the Conservation and Commission and the Board of Health have expressed concerns. And I think that when your town's Conservation Commission and Board of Health express concerns about a substance, it behooves us to heed their warnings. Um, the specific statement by the Conservation Commission was, this is relevant to our jurisdiction because there is a stormwater drain from the playgrounds that empties into riverfront and into bordering land subject to flooding. It's very close to riverfront area, which is a critical cold water fishery. This type of material, that's rubber poured in place, is known to have contaminants that aren't good for people or ecology, and that is the concern. Um, so thank you for reconsidering your decision about this, and I look forward to to you getting away from this rubber port in place. I'll remind you that uh, in terms of cost control and other situations that you uh, appropriately pointed out, the combination of materials can be used. There is a track record of this in Europe, and I'm glad that you're going to be, be looking into that. Um, and in terms of uh, talking about resilience and other issues, um, one of the things that the Board of Health wants to do is to further examine this and to consult with with experts in the field who I think are the people that should be uh, giving you information on this. So um, for example, Turi and the National Center for Health Research. Um, so again, um, you know, once you bring chemicals onto a site, we own them, those are there. If they start leaching, that, ha that has happened. You cannot undo that. So best to avoid bringing rubber poured in place onto the site in the first place and to use alternate materials. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Bruce, I have brought you in. You can unmute. I think I have. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, I was a, a little surprised uh, to hear what Deb said, Deb Leonard, and her comment a moment ago, where she was encouraging, uh, I guess, if I understood correctly, some kind of uh, expedition on your part uh, in order to allow the school committee time to uh, render some comment. Um, I thought that this was the school building committee, and uh, and I and, and so far in the two and a half years we haven't had the school committee itself um, being expected to chime in or, or, or render some kind of review or support or or comment. And so I uh, this is a question I know you can't answer it now necessarily, but but do I there, do I correctly understand that the school committee is beginning to uh, 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 expect to render uh, opinions and so forth in this project? So Kathy, can I respond to that? Because I think it does need clarification. Yes, please do. So um, Bruce and Deb, if you're still there. So the, the MSBA requires 
that the school committee take a vote on any proprietary items. So Corkeen would not be the only other, the only item. There are some other items that are related to security and fire protection. It's not an opinion on the, the thing. On this, not they're not weighing in on Corkeen or the other which is they're weighing in on the use of proprietary items. So that's hopefully that clarifies that the school committee does not need to go out and look at the, I mean, they're welcome to go out and look at the material, but the specific request is to consider the use of a proprietary item in the bid process. Thank you, Margaret. Very helpful. So I'm not seeing any other hands up. Um, so I, again, I want to um, thank the committee. Uh, this was, uh, I thought, a, a rich discussion. And uh, I trust that our design team will be able to wrestle with this. I know it was, uh, uh, it's, it's a late coming set of issues. So I look forward to the next meeting. And I, just so everyone knows, I think you're aware that everything has been posted. So if people want to go back and look at the cost estimates and the um, they are in the packet. And one of the things that the town has started to do is look forward to things like the Eversource money that we're going to be getting because we've gone with ground source heat pumps and an efficient design, making sure we're on track with those documents. And then when this fantastic building is built, uh, billing the IRS for the first time ever direct credits to a public entity for what we've done in terms of our heating and our solar. So, so those are working behind the scenes that it's not the design team in particular, but it's on the it's at the town level. So it it's a, we are a first in a lot of ways on this on this school, um, which is for me very exciting. So I want to I want to thank everybody, and um, Margaret will get back in touch with people about. There's some dates been penciled in. Um, for various subcommittee or working group committee, and so we have some busy time, but we're only meeting once a month going forward as the full committee. So unless I see any further comments, I think we are adjourned at 10.03. Um, that's it. Thank you very much, everyone. We are adjourned. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye.